So welcome uh, to Jay Booth from uh, Diamond to talk about ambient pressure at PLS. Well, hello everyone. Um, I will check the line. Hopefully they can hear. Yeah, so my name is Jay Booth. I'm a beam scientist over at Diamond Light Source. I'm in pressure at SPS beam. I'll give a little bit of an introduction to ambient pressure at SPS, but Talk about some of the challenges and some of the advantages. Okay, so what do we mean by ambient pressure FPS? Depends who you ask, but my definition would be anything that's not new HP FPS. Um, and why might we want to go up there? So we've already seen today a few applications where people want to go to higher pressures. So one of the key ones for houses um, doesn't need to be said, but real low people houses is not done at 10 to minus time. So you don't want to go higher pressure. I want to look at gas solid interfaces, gas liquid interfaces, liquid solid interfaces. We've also got things like uh, pharmaceuticals, biology, things that are generally aqueous. There, you don't want to dry things out. You've got a cell in your system. You don't want to pump out all the air, dry it out. You might want to operate in the background. We're so talking about there, vapor pressure, water room temperature, 20 minute last or so. Here we've got things like um, polymers, electrical devices, sensors. Again, these can operate in a number of different vacuum scales. So, anti UHV or up to the community bar. We've got energy materials, batteries, very well seen books today. Um, Electrolytes, ionic liquids, things. Sometimes they work in chemistry, sometimes they don't. Atmospheric chemistry, again, mainly water based things. So we're talking about in the tens of millibar regime. Corrosion processes, um, heritage, conservation. If we get an artifact from a museum, they might not want us to pump it down, dry it out, destroy it. You might want to work in <laughs> environmentally relevant conditions. So again, a few tens of millibars. And also things like lubrication. So you might have a sample that's covered in oil, but you don't necessarily want to put into a nice clean good the FPS. So what we do all have in common, we want to look at the near surface region, look at the chemical nature and composition. XPS, main focus today, also in excess. So extra absorption to the heat, which is something we can do at synchron. And this is what we want to do. We don't necessarily need very high flux or very high energy resolution. And I'll show you some examples later of why they're necessary ones. Okay, so is it a simple task to see how many pressure it is? Sounds quite simple. You can see the blockchain. You can't quite do that. Our beamline or our X-ray source in our lab system and also our analyzer have to be in UHP conditions. The electrons don't get into the analyzer, don't get to the detector otherwise. So we pressurize our analysis chamber, a few millibars gas. What do we have to consider? We've got to get the x-rays from our source onto our sample, and we've got to get the filter electrons from our sample into the analyzer. So we've got to consider the x-ray transmission of our gas and also the electron. And of course, we've got to consider the ionization of our actual material. So both of these transmissions, the x-rays and electrons, are very heavily dependent on pressure. We also want energy. Okay, so. We've got these three factors electrical transmission, cross section, and electron transmission. Photons and electrons behave very differently, gases. So, just to give you an idea of some sort of numbers, in a millibar of gas, your X ray, soft X ray photons, so 1000 dB or so, have path lengths of about 100 millimeters. So, yeah, that's okay, not too bad if you think of the general size of your chamber. Electrons, though, about 100 times greater attenuation. Not short of path lengths. We really have to get very close for that. Yeah. Our sample. And we also have cross section. So, in general, in the lab source, you don't have to worry too much about this. You only have two or three photon energies that you might be able to use. But at synchron, we can change the photon energy. You have to really consider what our cross section is for a given element, for a given transition, and that changes the photon energy. <coughs> so, we have a really strong energy dependence here. This, um, on the top left, the, uh, the red line is a cross section of the oxygen 1s. 
And it's basically shows that as you get higher and higher virgin energies, this box actually drops off dramatically. On the other hand, the uh, transmission of our electrons, our photons, is terrible at the moment. So we have to balance this. We can't just get a massive virtual energy and a massive net gain for our electrons. We have to balance. And these plots in green and blue, um, shown with different gases, so the water and nitrogen at different pressures. And you can see there's a massive change in the transmission here. So you really have to balance all these three factors. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, it takes a bit of experience. Um, and it changes from sample to sample. But in general, you see a massive pressure dependence above about 3 millibars. So up to about 3 millibars, you're kind of fine. It doesn't really matter what you're doing. Above that, you really need to be careful. Um, 10 to 30 millibars is kind of like a standard ambient pressure regime. And in general, we're not going to energy between about 800 to 2,000 dB. So give you an idea of what this looks like on this standard spectrum. This is gold for F. So foil. I'm just pressurizing this out. So we start on the red curve, and break down the blue curve. Blue curve multiplied by 10, and you can see at 30 millibars, very, very low. This is pure gold. The gold for it, one of the brightest transitions you'll ever see. So if you imagine trying to look at some really high loop surface species in a sample at these high pressures, very challenging. Okay, how do we actually do this in a kind of technical term? What's different? From an ambient pressure clear system for a normal system. And it all comes down to separating the high pressure around your sample with the UHD in your analyzer. So we have the differential pumping system, which pretty much did the small hole. So this is a picture of what a sample chamber looks like, but your x rays coming in, some sort of x-ray window, the transparent the x-rays let them in, don't let the gas out. And you have a small hole that lets through some of your photo electrons and some of the gas. You repeat this with a few more small holes and a few more pumps, and eventually you can get to a setup um, where you have your analyzer at UHV, for example, at the bars, 10 to bars. The problem you have is that you only get a few electrons. So you're only selecting, as we've got here, a tiny fraction of electrons that come from your surface. So probably 20 years ago, people started putting electrostatic lenses inside these modern stages. Which focus the electrons back onto these apertures, massively increase the transmission of the analyzer, and actually makes it possible to do ambient pressure with yes. So they're pretty complicated analyzers. Um, the back half, so here to here, is exactly the same as any HPS analyzer you have. The difference is all here we have your pumping stages and event systems. And this allows us to go up to 100 millibars. Um, you don't actually see anything at 100 millibars, you don't get any electrons or x rays coming out. But pressure wise, you can pressurize this system up at 100 millibars. And right at the end, we have a hole of about 0.3 millimeters. So we match our x ray beam to basically fill space in front of that. So about 100 microns or so across. Okay, so just to uh, give you an overview of these systems, this was 2014. That picture taken from everything from the world has at least one beam line. There's only a perfect PS. There's also many, many lab systems downloaded, um, including one well, Manchester run by Alex Walton, which I think is part of the yep. setup. So that's user accessible. My proposal is to get on that. Um, also, one of these, um, Sven Schroeder, which is a biomesca, which is designed to be a very simple system. You just see it's not clear. It does everything for you. It works. And this is one I, I worked with during my uh, postdoc for him. And it's no, it's not that much larger than the normal FPS system. So very accessible. Okay, why might we want to do the same from some of this? Um, main advantage is the tunable voting energy. So we can pick up those energy. We can increase the cross-section if we want to increase our um, signal. We can avoid OGs. So sometimes in life. With your fixed photon energies, you can't avoid it. You've got energy sitting on the end of your XPS peak. And with a photo with the uh, synchron, you can shift it from the move it out of the way, makes your fitting a lot easier. We can forcibly render the XPS. And this is a thing where we tune our fixed photon energy right to the absorption edge that we want to look at. And this massively increases the signal that we get. And finally, we can change the kinetic energy of our photo electrons. 
So we can do depth profiling in a non-destructive way. So by increasing the kinetic energy of our photo electrons, increasing our photon energy, we can probe them for deeper to our surface. And at our beam line, we can go up to a few thousand um, dB, so two and a half thousand, three thousand or so, and get a few nanometers into our surface. If you want to go really deep, you can do a hack space on these systems. And there are hack space that are pressure, XPS as well, and they can really look at buried interfaces. Why you might want to look quite so deep when you've got gas above it and your interaction routine is not necessarily deep. It's a uh, interesting question. The other thing about synchrotron is the flux density. So on a bending magnet beam line like the 7 we're roughly equivalent. We're going to have source at certain energies. Um, but if you go for an undulated beam line, you can gain two, three, four of this magnitude more flux density and therefore more signal. Very polarization. Not necessarily that important for general XPS for this option. And again, time resolution is a thing. So in a standard XPS, you have the same open flux at a time. In a synchrotron, the way that the uh, X ray is generated, you have electron pulses running around the storage room and easy to build pulses of X rays. So you can use this to actually do time resolved measurements in a time. And finally, because we can vary the photon energy, we can do X ray absorption. Yes. The drawbacks access to the synchrotron is difficult. You have to write code, you have to wait six months, see if you get time. Um, and this high flux density, which is great, get lost signal, also means you get a lot of damage, which is not useful. Okay, so this is uh, Beam 19 of the O7, um, headed up by Gil Kells, the other Beam 9 scientists, technicians. We actually have two Beam lines. The, uh, we have our ambient pressure XPS beam line, which has been going for about five years now. And we have a new beam line, type of books, XPS and SAS uh, beam line, which has been going about 18 months. Okay, so this is kind of some uh, detail about the end station. Our energy range on the uh, ambient pressure XPS goes from about 100 EV to about 2800 EV. Moderate resolving power and a beam size is about about. Uh, photon flux 10 to the 11 photons per second, um, roughly similar to what we get from the lab source, maybe a little bit higher. So, so we have a whole bunch of different end stations that we can put on for different sample environments. We'll look at uh, some of these now. So, I mentioned earlier that the, uh, the analyzer differential pumps, we also have beam lines differential pumps. Um, a lot of the systems you have a silicon nitride window separates your beam line from your high pressure gas environment. That's a disadvantage if you want to do absorption measurements because you actually pass through this window and slightly absorbed by it and it can get build up and contamination. Right. So we avoid that by having a whole nother bunch of pumps very similar to the analyzer, just on the other. This is what our sort of sample environment looks like in our standard setup. We've got a little sample holder, it's about an inch across. And then the analyzer comb, you can't even see it, the point of three uh, and it's holding the end of it, but we bring that really close to the analyzer to our experiments. Okay, so we have two main um, kind of sample environments to consider. Of course, the main one is gas flavor interactions. So this is just where we pressurize the chamber above the system. We have a uh, pretty confused control gas system. So we have sort of 14 so common gases always available. Um, takes a lot of the safety worries out of it. You can just type in a one, how many glass of CO, whatever of oxygen, and it will deliver that. With this kind of system at room temperature, you don't get much absorption on those surfaces. So you're looking at uh, maybe a nanometer worth of gas absorption, depending how we have the surface. Yeah. Might want to go to liquids. So you can cool your surface down. Um, in principle, we can go to liquid pastures. So this chamber, you get massive problems with that. Um, so we don't have a tennis but to get liquids, what we use is a capillary uh, system. So this is developed in Manchester by uh, Alex Walton. And then we have this tiny capillary that we bring really close to the sample, push a little bit of water out onto it, move our sample so we get a really thin film liquid water, and then we bring our analyzer close to the gas. Right. And then we can get quite thick layers of water and bubbles of water. So I'm not going to stop here. Of course, the thicker the water layer, go tend to look through it, see what's underneath. So it's balanced how thick your water layer is. 
is what you want to actually see. Okay, so finally, we also have reaction cells. So this is generally for more of the electric chemistry of systems. So we have a little reaction cell, yeah, a couple of centimeters in size, where you pass either high pressure gas, by high pressure, I mean like bombard gas, or liquid. We could use silicon nitride. So this is great for angular absorption. The electrons coming in and getting out. The electrons don't go through silicon nitride. So you this very yes. So to do that, we have a collaboration with that wrong weather upstream in Oxford, where we have a bracket membrane. So this lets the photo electrons come out of the cell, and then we can do it to gas. It's incredibly challenging um, because the gas pressure or liquid pressure generally also wants to get through even there's a graphene, um, but it does work. And then the third method is we have a permeable membrane. And we put our catalyst on top of this, and then we get a little bit of water going through the membrane, and, and we also have electric chemistry going on at the same time. So this is sort of schematic of our electrochemical cell. It's a pretty standard three electro cell. Um, and we can either use better absorption or we need an appropriate membrane for the FPS. Okay, so just talk about a few other things that we need to consider when we're doing MFF FPS. We can do other liquids, so liquid jets set up, they're pretty common around the world now. We can also probe the reaction products. So we can bring our analyzer really close to the top of our surface. Okay. I'm going to you suck out any reaction products that have. So if you've got a catalysis or something on the surface, you suck those reaction products towards the analyzer. And we can have a mass spec there, there's a bit of DC as well. And we can look at what's going on in the surface. Charge compensation is important. So a lot of catalysts are on some sort of insulating support. We can't run a flow current down here, that's just, they just don't work. What we can do is we can put a few millibars of some inert gas, helium, argon, something like that. And the extra is coming into your surface once you ionize that gas, which can lead to charge compensation. Now, we'll ionize helium and argon. It will also ionize whatever interesting gas you've got in there. So if you've got oxygen in there, if you've got CO2, if you've got water, you will form ions that are active and will be chemistry in your surface. And this is one of the biggest challenges um, we have ambient pressure XPS in general, so they are going to allow for synchrotron, you get the induced chemistry. And you have to be really, really careful what you're seeing. You see some effects, is it due to beam, is it due to catalysis, is it due to something else? Cleanliness is a key, a uh, key thing to think about. Uh, surface scientists are well used to keeping everything clean, baking it, uh, really pure gases and so on. The same thing applies even when you've got many bars of gas product. Some trace uh, contaminants will appear on the surface and they appear quickly and they will mess up the interpretation. Contamination also uh, it's pretty common if you come after somebody else's experiment. So, in a, on a beam line, we have a user. Tuesday, we have a day to day. Wednesday, we have another user. Depending on what the previous users used, you might see evidence of those gases coming up to your surface. Um, so, we have to be quite careful scheduling these experiments. Um, if you've got your own system in the lab, a bit more uh, latitude there, um, but this is something to really consider. And then the final question there, is a few of our really representative analysis is something that everybody asks, um, and it's really important to think about. So there are many uh, new points. Okay, so let's look at a few examples of the kind of data that we get. So this was some, uh, some recent data, and this was growing tungsten uh, sulfide on a gold crystal. So the first set of data, basically gold core Fs, the gold foil, and the tungsten is getting deposited and also the carbon. And this is a non ambient pressure experiment. So 10 to minus 6 millibars, you can probably do this on most FPS. They grow the layer of tungsten, and then what they want to do is solve it into this. Um, and here they need to go to higher pressures, they need to crack. This horrible molecule that sticks around forever and ever. Um, so they go to about a minibar and take XPS every minute or so and show they throw this kind of sulfide the surface. And this can be done at temperatures. So I would say we can cool down if you want to. In general, for catalysis, you want to heat up. I think this was done at yeah, relatively high temperatures, so 700 C. It's about the limit of what we can achieve on the minibar of gas. So the other challenge of gases is that the heat transfer when you've got a lot of gas in your system can be massive. So you're not only heating up yourself, or you're heating up all the gas when you've just got 
action so right, the chamber was well, so another kind of catalysis this is a blading boil it's just to be looking at the oxidation of blading oil in a few millibars of oxygen uh doing a temperature ramp of time and these are relatively quick next gas spectrum so these are yes, less than a minute or so for the oxygen minus the palladium and you can see a really clear transition from palladium to palladium oxide at about 330 c you can measure the shifts in the palladium 3ds um and you've got to look at the bulk oxygen signal and one thing to point out here is in oxygen in our system and you get peaks from whatever gas you've got in your system here in the spectrum uh, usually they're quite a shifted binding energy on what you want to look at um, so we'll see an example next where they say right so this is some work i did a few years ago this is converting methane to methanol and basically we want to get methanol and we don't want to turn on methane to co or co2 so we want a catalyst that helps us do this at relatively low temperature and our catalyst is cerium proper pretty much and it's a really low coverage of cerium oxide on the Basically, we want to look at the effect of water here. So, we were operating about 20 millitors methane, and we pump in just a tiny amount of water, so 10 to minus 5 or so water. And we see this really helps the uh, catalysis, really drives the selectivity towards methanol formation rather than just combustion. And if you look at the uh, there's a lot of things here, the main one we're going to look at here is carbon 1s. Um, this compares different gas mixtures. So the bottom one's just methane, the one above is methane and oxygen, but that's methane and water, and the one above it is methane, and oxygen, and water, all of the operating conditions. And this peak here is gas phase methane. Um, and of course, it sits right on top of your spectrum. There's nothing really you can do about it. You could buy a sample to try and shift your um, levels a little bit, but you just have to be aware that it's there. It's just Okay, so that's about it for the atomic pressure XPS. Just want to put a quick advertisement here for our, our new line. Um, so, this is the branch that I've been building over the past few years. And this is our high throughput XPS, so UHV XPS. And the idea is basically to fill in some gaps that might exist on the lab based systems. So, if you've got a system that you can't measure in the lab, that you might help by having different photon energy and so on, this is ideal for that. So, it's a UHV system. We can either do our normal sample plates. In someone, or we have a large sample plate, so 50 by 50 millimeters sample plate, we can stick a whole bunch of samples in, measure them in the same way you would on any of the uh, systems. So, if you've got any, any samples for that, please do talk to me. Um, you're not going to use some time measuring that. We also have an ambient pressure next half sensation on here where we just do absorption spectroscopy. And this, when we say ambient, we mean ambient, we need one bar pressure. You can fill the whole thing up with gas and measure excess um, many interesting yields, so we don't have to worry about the electron attenuation. The photons coming in, photons going out. Um, and again, we can measure that on many samples. Okay, so some of you've got ambient pressure XPS. You can probe solid gas, uh, solid liquid, and liquid gas instabilities. It's now completely routine in the minibar regime at high temperatures. We have various sample environments that we can use. Soft x rays and synchrotron are key for kind of rapid measurements, difficult samples, uh, and there's still plenty of challenges with uh, contamination and experiment design. And as a note, if you want to apply for time on uh, either the beamers or any of the beamers, I'm going to deadline is next week. So, yeah, thanks for everyone involved in the work. Are there any questions? You mentioned the, I think you kind of answered this, but um, the effect of the gas conducting heat away. So when you're heating a sample, where do you measure the temperature? Do, do, are you measuring accurately on the sample? So we measure it on the sample. Um, we have a film couple here that screws right into place. Um, Yes, that's, so it's pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. Um, you, uh, you mentioned near the start about a resonant XPS. Um, I was just wondering, so the, the origin of that increased signal is that just 
using the increase in the last week uh, from so you also hit the um cross section last week that's the main oh. goal there um you can use it there are some systems so we're doing quite a lot of work on Syria and we use the resonance spectroscopy there because you can really if anyone's fitted Syrian 3D spectra if you want to talk about multiple effects you can know about that um you can go to the valence bands and you can look at the uh, 4x um Syrian there and you can excite it with two slightly different energies and you're really sensitive with four plus and three plus now it doesn't give you an absolute measure but it will give you a relative measure so on that, we used it pretty extensively. So here with 120 EV, the size of the three bus, which is 121 to the size of the four bus. Um, one issue with resonance spectroscopy, you're tuning your photon energy to exactly the um, separation in your energy levels, um, and you go up orders of magnitude in terms of the cross section. <laughs> what that means is you generate an awful lot of photo electrons in your sample, and it will blow a lot of electrons, a lot of secondary electrons, which do a lot of changes to your sample. So you have to be very careful there. Yeah, in, in the in the ambient hexap, does does the carbon contamination is a big issue? It's a big issue. So that was the, the main motivation for going to our differential point B one and the other branch was to do carbon nexus. Um, <coughs> and everything is covered in carbon. So Every surface you see, unless you bump it across the side of it's covered in carbon. Now we bounce our X rays off four mirrors and some proteins before they get to the sample. All of the mirrors are covered in carbon. So if you have a sample with a little bit of carbon in it, it doesn't compare to the amount of carbon that's on the beam. And if you put a silicon nitride membrane in there, that's also covered in carbon. So yeah, that's why we don't use silicon nitride on the beam. Yes, beam lines. On the next half beam line, you can't get away from it. So you have to have something like that. Um, you just have to be careful and account for it. You can measure, you can fill up with helium and measure your carbon minus helium, and then you have an idea of what you're back. It's but you definitely have to be aware of it. It might be a silly question, but in like your differential pumping stages when you use the electron optics to increase the transmission of the electrons through does that have an influence on the kinetic energy it doesn't. It doesn't. okay there's not any questions that i can see that are coming online um, uh, um, with, oh, yeah, one so your reaction cells um what kind of differences you see in the power and energy of the sources that you have to use versus standard? So for the um, yeah so the problem with here is if you do our gas experiment um we actually deposit our calculus generally either on the back of the silicon nitride or on the back of the cell. If you have on the back of the cell, you have two millimeters of gas. Um, and you sometimes just see gas. Um, it's very difficult to control distances um, without having a really specialized this kit. Um, but if you do the other round of say, if you deposit on silicon nitride, you only really see the catalyst and a little bit of gas. Um, so, your surface sensitivity is not necessarily a massive thing here. Your reactions are only happening at the surface. Um, so the changes you see are going to be the changes at the surface, are going to be your reaction to parts of your system. Um, this is also a time to heat. So at a few minimum, you've got a lot of heat loss. We were doing fish troughs. So we had a bar of hydrogen, basically, which is the in there as well. There, the heat loss is incredible. So we, we have a resistor heater on these cells, which is just a wire up around it. That's running at like 50 amps to get to like 300 C of sound. And that heats up everything inside the chamber, inside everything around it. Um, the next iterations on this will have actually active cooling. Um, so ideally, you only want to heat up your patches, you only want to heat up your patches. But that can also do catalysis. So, yeah, if you have a laser heating system, they're expensive and dangerous. We're not quite there yet. But it's, 
I would say every application probably needs its own cell. They will have their own challenges. So, but we are open to that. So if you've got a particular thing in mind, come speak to us. Yeah. We have engineering teams. Do you still use an aluminum source for reaction cells? No. So this is, so I suspect for a lab-based system, um, you probably could do it with graphene membranes. Um, I don't think you'd have enough bucks. That would be very challenging. So even on the vending magnet, you know, we're at, we are running out of bucks. So anytime you go through a membrane, you lose the 50% of your bucks. So you've got to do that twice. You're probably now really quickly. Um, if you then put a bunch of gas in there, you then lose even more signal. So we do often make these cells and then test them on other beamers. So I don't have dirty beamers, guns where they do have more bucks. Um, and they sometimes work better. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Please do talk with any of the team, get your proposals in. I'm assuming the proposal rounds are at least six months. Sorry, six. Um, it'll be six months after the 28th for the next one. But if you just got an idea, we can do what's called a rapid access proposal. So this would just be to test your sample and you just get like a day of beam time. So yeah, you don't have to go into a full proposal right away. Thank you.